Hello, Helen Yeomans. Hello, Kate Valentine. <laughs> well, I do believe we are live on Facebook, so that's exciting. And we have just finished Songlines, um, where you taught Ceremony Boogie, which I'm still really high from. That was amazing. Yeah, it was, it was a lovely session, actually. Very enthusiastic singers you've got there, Kate. Yeah, isn't it extraordinary that without even hearing people, we just feel that connection of enthusiasm through their little tiny boxes? Yeah. Amazing. So anyway, whoever's watching, my name is Kate Valentine. I'm founder of Singing Mama's Choir and I have the great pleasure today of meeting Helen Yeomans. So we have a little mini series, a little personal project of mine to meet the choir composers behind the songs which we just love to sing. There, there lies a, a choir composer somewhere and, and, um, and today we meet Helen. So Helen, are you happy if we just fire away and start asking you some questions? Totally, fire away. Amazing, so you're down in <laughs> Devon at the moment, is that right? I'm in Totnes in Devon, where I've been for 24 years, yeah. It's sunny down there today. It is. It's, yeah, it's not always sunny, but it's, it's normally a bit warmer than everywhere else, so it's, it's nice. <laughs> Good place to be. So, Helen, can you tell me, um, first of all, what do you love about singing? Um, <laughs> singing in harmony, I... Oh, <laughs> Jesus. It's, it's, it's more than the sum of its parts, isn't it? That's what, how I describe it best, I think when you're singing in harmony, when the third part comes in. I mean, I like singing on my own as well to songs, but I notice that when I'm singing to songs on the radio, I always sing the harmony anyway. Mm. And I always did. And I never knew that everybody else didn't, or most people didn't. I thought everyone did that. So I realized that harmony singing actually is what, what it is for me. Mm. Um, yeah, and so choir, choir mm. music obviously is, is the best thing. I'm with you on that. And as a composer, Helen, can you remember the very first song that you ever wrote? Yeah, the, well, the first song I ever, golly, do you know what, when I was at primary school, there was a uh, composer tune competition. This is when I lived in Crosby. And um, I wrote a song with my sister about the seasons, about January, February, March, and we won it. Um, and then I didn't think anything more of it. And I didn't do any music. I, did, I mean, I learned, I learned some instruments, but stopped when I was 12 and then did nothing else and didn't do music at school or college um, until I was in my late 30s. And then I joined a choir just as an idea of something to do because I kind of had this yearning to sing. And the first song I think I wrote was an arrangement of a song. Uh, there's a song called The Java Jive by the Ink Spots. And it was the time of the big GM crop pr protests. Well, they were big down here, but we, we protest a lot down here about that kind of thing. And I changed the words and I arranged it for a cappella harmony. Um, do you know, I can't even remember how we, how we changed it now. And then from that, I thought, oh, that sounded okay. And then I started writing songs for that choir. Um, as a choir was, member? You were just... As a choir member, yeah. I just sort of started to pull apart the songs that we were listening to and trying to work out what was, what was amazing about some songs and that other songs just didn't kind of make you go, oh God, yeah. Okay, so this, thought, yeah. this is fascinating already because you say you've got to your late thirties and you joined a choir just for something to do and, and then you find yourself rearranging a song. Yeah. So to go, go back to 12 year old Helen <laughs> and she's writing the seasonal song. Can you remember that seasonal song? Um, I just remember it had, there was just me and my sister and one of us sung the harmony. I can't remember who it was. Um, January brings us no wood. That's, I can't even remember the words, Kate. Um, and I keep forgetting I actually did that with my sister. And, and then, yeah, there was this like 25 year gap when I did other things. And so obviously there was some, to, to have won a competition, there was some talent already there. Um, yeah, I, I was taught, my father's very musical. My father's side of the family is very musical. My grandma was very musical and, and my father brought me up. Right. So we were, we learned instruments from the age of dot without having any choice about the matter. And we practiced half an hour a day, whether we had any choice or not, you know, it was just how it was in my family home. And what were your so instruments? I, instruments were violin and piano. So I got to a really, really high standard on both of those by the age of 12. I was in the Sefton Youth Orchestra, um, the lead, lead violinist at the age of 12. And so I was very accomplished at those instruments and that's how I learned to read music. Did you enjoy playing as a 12? 
it, whew, do you know, I thought a lot about this because I gave them up very, very readily at, at 12, but that was partly because I moved to a different part of the country. So I moved to the Northeast from Liverpool to Sunderland in the Northeast. And it was a very different environment and it wasn't very conducive to me playing instruments. Let's just put it that way. The secondary school, the comprehensive school I went to was, it, it wasn't going to cut it with the girls at all. And I was trying to make friends. So part of trying to fit in meant having to give up anything I was good at which included the violin and the piano so the very first term of those of the new school I stopped so and I didn't think anything more of it I was more more desperate to fit in yeah. than keep my and I also wonder I was taught the, the classical way of playing an instrument and I think if I'd been taught say Irish jig music on the fiddle mm -hmm. or jazz on the piano maybe I would have played them for longer and even secretly and but yeah. who knows and the music surrounding you as a child, as you're growing up and into your teens, do you remember having a particular style of music that you really enjoyed or that was played in your household? It's very classical. My father was a classical pianist. Um, so we only ever heard classical music from the family um, until I became a teenager. And then I got really heavily into heavy metal. <laughs> <laughs> I would say I was singing heavy metal songs, but yeah, it was a very, very, I was very rebellious as a teenager. So I went from one, one kind of like my double life with my father and my, my family, and then this double life in my bedroom and going out, which was completely different. Wow. Okay. So then you didn't study music at college? No, no. I think having, being able to read music as a kid when I had to, you know, play my instruments, it, it, when I started the choir, when I joined this choir again, when I was in my mid thirties, I was given a sheet of music in this choir, Global Harmony, Ros, run by Ros Walker in, here in Totnes. And it was like being given a book from my first language. It, was, it, it never left me. I, I, could, I was reading, I found myself reading this song, the tenor line, off the page without it even passing my brain mm. and realising that it had never left me. It was, it was quite interesting after 25 years of not looking at a piece of music. And what was that like to join that choir? Oh, it, it totally totally changed my life I conceived my third child that very night of the first choir session I was ecstatic <laughs> ecstatic I remember I remember standing there I still remember the song that was the first song that we learned it was called Aeolian Harp it was a I think it was a Seth Seth Houston song a shape note song and I remember just stopping singing and just standing in this room and just thinking oh my god this is all I want to do everything else in my life until then just faded away it just it was irrelevant. All the careers I'd had, the degree I did, wow. just didn't, it was irrelevant. I just lived for Wednesday nights. Wow. And, and so that was a turning point then in your life, let's say. Mm, yeah. And was, so quite quickly, you found yourself arranging songs. And how did that come about? Um, well, that arrangement of the, of the Java Jive was, was an experiment, really. You know, I, these are the days when I used to write things down on manuscript paper in pen and, or pencil. Mm. and just a group of girls we just did it in our own time and what happened how did I write the my first song that I actually composed was called Chanson and it was kind of putting together it was like a, a jigsaw puzzle I was trying I was analyzing all the songs we were singing from all sorts of different traditions African songs gospel songs pop songs whatever and I was just noticing what was making those songs brilliant which part of those songs was brilliant was it the chorus was it the verse was it was it the rhythm? Was it the syncopation? Was it the funkiness? Was it the chords? Was it the, what was it that was making those bits of those songs so good that where everybody was going, oh God, I just love that. And it's not just me. It's like everybody's going mm, at a certain point in the song. Could be a clashing chord that then resolves. So I just started um, noticing that and I bought myself a secondhand piano and dusted off my old piano books, which I'd kept and just started playing around on the piano and just just trying to imitate those bits of the songs that was was really resonating with me and 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 then i just started um writing writing just practicing the treble clef and the, and the, which which keys have to which sharps having to basically go back to when i was 12. yeah yeah and then i just had this tune in my head it was it was a it was just a tune at that point but it was quite strident nothing more than that and um i started thinking 
what does that make me feel like you know what do i feel about that tune what does it make what, what do i feel strident about or triumphant about or forthright about and at that time of discovering my voice it was it was about the fact that we don't sing as a culture generally we sing to the radio we idolize pop stars but in our everyday life people in the west don't sing very much anymore we don't sing while we work we don't sing while we're cooking i mean most people so it, that became the theme and then I managed to find phrases that fitted that tune. And that's how the song came about. And eventually, to cut a long story short, I, I, I sang it into a cassette player, right? In the days when we had cassette players, I sang that tune with the words that I worked out. Who in the world is singing? Who in the world is making song? <laughs> I just did quite a few repetitions. And then I'd play that. And then in another cassette recorder, I'd have another tape. And I played that and then I sang the harmony. And then I'd do it back again. I mean, talk about low tech. Talk about ahead of the curve, actually, Helen. <laughs> what we're all doing now on these four track recorders, basically you invented that tech with those doubled up cassettes. Yeah. Quite determined, I really, guess. isn't it? Very determined. And then when I worked it out, I, I wrote it in, in pen on manuscript paper and I did it in pencil first and then rubbing it out endless times and then going over the top in pen and then going down the photocopy shop and photocopying it 40 times and giving it to, my, to the choir to teach, to so learn. This is extraordinary. I mean, you've, it, with that story, you've just answered a whole load of my questions already. But what I'm picking up on is that you just said you had your third child that first night of that life-changing experience of singing choir. So, and then you're, you're, you're de determined to kind of understand how these choir songs are crafted. And you're, you're obviously working towards the opening of your career in, in composing here and and if people are watching that that don't know i mean helen just in the network of choirs that we have in singing mama's choirs you've you've got like if we've got a top 10 probably five of the songs in our top 10 are, are from you that you've written there you know we got all the love um ceremony boogie obviously is a fabulous warmer that we use um love is the power um you know, personal favourites of mine as well and arrangements that you've made. But anyway, we'll, we'll say more about that in the text when we share this um, video on YouTube. Um, but where, Helen, do you, do, did you and do you find the time to be this creative in your work with a family? How it, does that work? It's, it was the biggest stumbling block, I have to say. And I think this applies to any creative person who's a who is a parent and not just mothers but fathers as well i know fathers who who are just as creative as me and never have the time it's the biggest frustration and i lost count of the number of times that i would be reading a bedtime story to my my young kids and i all in, in my head was the last chord that i had to find or the last phrase of a, of a song that i just couldn't get and I had to be reading a story or, or, or making dinner and it would just have to be there kind of simmering away in the background. And when they went to bed, I would try and finish it. But then I was exhausted most of the time. I think um, when the kids went to school, when they got to playgroup age, when they got to three, things really, really opened up a lot then. Um, I think for a creative person, you need to be, you need to have support at home if you're a parent. You know, you need, I mean, most I kind of envy people who are, who've got kind of a muse, who does the domestic work, who looks after the kids, who makes the dinner, who does the shopping. So all you've got to do is be the great creative. You know, that was never the case for me. Mm. And I, I don't know if it's harder for women than men. I'm not sure. I, I hate to stereotype, mm. but I found that really, really difficult. And things didn't, I mean, didn't open up until the kids were three. I didn't leave Totnes for the first three years of, of being, starting my choir and writing songs. Yeah, you know, you describe this this time and I I, it, I relate, you know, I've, I've got lots of children at home also and many of the children, uh, many of the women that are in our choir network and, and many of the um, singing mama choir leaders and other women outside of our network um, with children seem to have quite strong creative impulses. It seems to be something that goes hand in hand and women also in our choir, in our choirs were kind of reporting back to us saying, you know, I heard a song. The, these these songs seem to be coming. So whether it's um, whether it's linked, whether there's something in this kind of you know this collective experience of being with children, or, or whether it's just all I know of at the moment. But there seems to be um, you know people saying I, I I just I sang it into my phone and and then 
and they're, they're really great songs they're hearing. Um, I think there's a lot of truth in that, Kate. I think there is something creative, apart from creating a baby, that you become more creative in yourself. I've heard this said a lot as well. Um, and I think also for, for me, I tend to write when I'm moved by something, yeah. really moved, you know, to the point where it's either write a song or smash a window, you know. It's like right. normally two things I've heard on the news or um, experiences that I've seen or stories I've been told will inspire me. That They're the things that inspire me most. And I think you get more moved as when you've had children, you kind of, you, 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 it's another layer, another level of emotional awakening in a way. It's like you're, you're more tuned in. Like before I, before I had children, I, I would hear th stories on the news that would affect me, but they wouldn't move me to the point where I just had to do something. Whereas when I've had children, I mean, any news story to do with kids and, you know, I'd just be in tears and or really angry or whatever. And I found songwriting was was a very useful outlet. Mm. And I think that's possibly fair to say it's true for people working with children, too. We've got some of the leaders that, that lead for us that don't have children, but are working in that close connection. And Absolutely. And bubbling up. Um, but that's that's led me on to thinking about um, sometimes because I, I I know you and I, I've had the absolute delight of singing with you um, at various workshops and um, something that that really strikes me about the way you teach and bring your songs that I then um, as a leader will go and um, take with the song is is the story is the the place and the time and the why and the how. Um, and I've, yeah, I've definitely noticed that when you've been teaching and sharing something, I've heard a, a really deep, deep and true story about where it came from, even Ceremony Boogie just now. And so the part of the inspiration for, for Meet the Quiet Composers series, which we're doing right now, um, was, was that to kind of, to, to bring, um, about within the Singing Mama's Choir Network and beyond this culture of when we're sharing the songs, really bringing with the first time it was brought, the first time it was heard or the first time it was birthed or however you want to describe it, with the person, like carry that person and that intention and that imbue it with the same kind of quality with which it was like really to treasure the songs. And, um, and I, I feel that from you, from like, so are you able to say more about how like, that moment when they when you have this impulse to write um whether it's from something that you're moved or passionate about um is there a sensation or a feeling or anything that happens for you when you write these songs it's a, it's a cathartic thing it's a cathartic thing of getting uh, your emotions um out into a song through music it's almost a relief you know i remember um and storytelling, you know, I, I, I appreciate it. People do want to know the stories. I used to be quite reticent about telling my story about how I write the song. It's all about me. Um, but actually, I learned that people really want to know, you know, they, even, if, 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 even if it's a personal story. And I resist writing personal st songs, actually, because I think, why, why should I make 40, 50 people sing something about me? You know, I always try and make it a universal subject. So it might even start from a personal point of view, but I always think, what has everybody else got that in this song that they can relate to? So I'll take out the me and I'll make it us and I'll take out the I and I'll take, make it a we um, so that it's more kind of accessible to people. Um, and I think, I mean, I'll just give you a couple of examples. So there's a song called Ola Mama, which I do with my Tula Mamas, but it's also a big choir song. And that came out of a story when my kids were tiny. I, you know, I had a baby on the breast, a child on the hip and a child you know, on the toilet, wanting its bum wiped and the cat needs feeding. I'm trying to cook dinner. The phone's ringing. You know the scene. Sounds like my life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and in that moment, I thought, I want to, I want to remember this. And I, I noticed how many times the kids were calling my name and I was stopping what I was doing and saying, yeah. And I thought, without them knowing, I put a bit of paper on the fridge and I just thought, I just wonder how many times we as parents answer to this name of mum or could be dad. And I just put a little line on this piece of paper and just each time it's like, mom, mom, mom. And often there was nothing else at the end of that. They just need to know that you're there. And it got to 150 in less than an hour. Oh, okay. 150 times, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three. And they didn't really know what I was doing. And I just thought, right, that, there's a song here. 
<laughs> and it was like a universal call and response song from parent to child. Hola, mama, baba, yay. Hola, papa, baba, yay. Hola, mama, baba, yay. Oh, mama, papa, back her off, baba, yay. <laughs> And then I was playing with that and I was thinking it's kind of like, um, it could be almost like a come by your simple song. Oh, mama, papa, oh, papa. It had, had that kind of feel to it. And I was kind of frying the eggs and making the beans and, and doing all this. And this is going through my head. And then when the kids had gone to bed, I started playing around with that. And then I thought, well, if I change the third note into a minor key, and change that, that note into, I mean, you've got to remember, I don't really know a lot about musical theory, just from basic piano and violin playing. And I just changed the chords a little bit and got them really crunchy. And then I had a song. It wasn't too obvious. It was something slightly, slightly off center. Um, and then whenever I tell that story, it's great because all the mothers and all the parents in the house, I guess go, yeah, I know that feeling. And then they can sing it with the feeling that I wrote the song with. So I'm sharing that experience then because it's a universal feeling. How many parents haven't felt that moment, haven't had that moment when they just want to tear the hair out? Um, and the other song that comes to mind, sorry, go on, Kate. Yeah, I just wanted to speak to that really, because that that you described there is for me what's missing in, in, in our human experience, in, in our culture, that many cultures do have that way of singing. They sing about those experiences and that's a way of processing and being with it and accepting it. Um, and you know, I'm inspired by the work of Sue Hart with her work, getting to know the Baka people mm. and they, the, their way of singing and other friends that have been to Bulgaria and just all these different cultures that have, we just sing about what is. Yeah. And when I feel like I've got songs like that in my life, in my own experience as a person and as a mother and as a worker and as a partner, whatever, I feel more well in myself. And so the simplicity of that song that you wrote and shared, you know, yeah, that to me is everything. <laughs> really. Yeah. Having those songs to accompany me in my journey as a human, as a journey as a mother, um, for me is at the heart of what this work is it's bringing back songs that are just totally accessible and that just help us feel better yeah. and feel more connected so i just sure. have to speak to that yeah you, you had another example you said um yeah i'll try and be brief because i know we've got haven't got time on our side um a news story news stories is i find i get inspired by news stories a lot and there's a song called stronger which i wrote after hearing a very harrowing news news story and it was set in Afghanistan and I'm not going to go into details because it's it's a really really awful story but I remember when the news broadcaster went on to the next item in the news and it was like is that it are we supposed to just sort of like forget what we've just heard there should be a counseling session after this news news program for everybody who's traumatized by what we have just been told you cannot just leave us in our homes with that story what are we supposed to do with that information? And I was so enraged. Do you know what? I, I, I almost wanted to torch my house down. I, I just didn't know what to do with this rage. And I went to see a friend and I was talking about it. And we were talking about people who do these, commit these awful crimes. And where is their soul? You know, and where are those universal truths that surely we all know to be true, such as peace is stronger than war and right is stronger than wrong and truth is stronger than lies and love is stronger than hate and even people who commit the most awful deeds they they don't come into the world with that something happens to people they don't come out of the womb stabbing their mother's breast mm. something happens and we we need compassion for everybody who gets damaged you know we're all damaged a little bit and some more than most and you know i can see it's a matter of degree I don't think people are born evil, but nevertheless, um, do those people go to their grave remembering? Do they remember that, that in, those innate universal truths, you know? And the song, the song came out of that. I, it was deliberately anthemic. It was deliberately prophetic. I remember playing on the piano and just, I landed with my hands on the keys and they almost found the first line of the song. It was just like da da sort of song. Um, so yeah, quite a, quite a few songs have come out of that. It's always when I'm moved though, you know, it could be a personal story to me or some, a friend of mine has 
something tragic that happens or something elating that happens and it's it's normally when i'm moved by something that's when the songs come they don't really come out of uh thin air they're not then well no they're coming from from your heart experience it sounds like and not through a head logic of of all your training um yeah. and that's the experience i think that most people i've seen and sung with that that hear and sing your songs connect in that way through the heart that's the, the power of your songs that you write they really are and I know I'm speaking for many people, quite extraordinary, the songs that you that you write um, and share. So time isn't on our side, you're right. So we're gonna, as, as, as hard as it is for me to try and wrap this up, just a couple more, maybe quicker questions. So, and these questions have come from people within our network that really want to ask you. So so we've heard about what, what inspires your writing a little bit, but is there, is there a, a, a something that something more that inspires your writing is that is there a who or a, or a what that inspires deeper who or what or is this your I definitely I, I mean I, golly the pagans will hate this but I do actually believe in God <laughs> believe whatever you want Helen <laughs> my name is Helen and I believe in God um I believe in well I believe in a bigger power I, be, I believe in a bigger entity um that is without and within and uh, when we are experiencing goodness, whether that's helping a person across the road or do, doing someone's shopping or doing something which you know is coming from a heart space, that is that to me is it's just that. That is the connection to the divine. You know, that is, that is God or the divine spirit or whatever you want to call it, um, connecting through us as a conduit. So no. I, do, I, I do have that, I suppose. That, whether it affects my writing or not, I don't know. But when I'm teaching, when I'm in a room full of people and we're all connected, that is the same spirit. They, they might call it something else. Yeah. That's fine. Okay. Oh, okay. And um, another couple of questions that people are itching to know. Um, what, what is it like to hear back a song that you have shared for the first time when you've written or, or you know, you've, you've shared a bit, a bit about the vulnerability of being about yourself? But is there a, how is that the first time you share a song? Oh. It's the ultimate honor, Kate. It's, I, I sometimes get quite embarrassed because I, it's like, it's such a gift. And it's like, sometimes I just think, who me? <laughs> I get this pleasure. What, what did I do in the last life to deserve this? It's, it's such an honor. It, that's why I only teach songs that I feel are worthy uh, of teaching because I, would, I wouldn't want to put anybody through the effort of learning a song just so I can hear it back. So for every song that I write, there's one collecting dust that I was not happy with. You know, it was not good enough to teach, but it, cause it is, it's. How do you know that's not good enough to teach that one? Uh, it out. Um, I don't know. It's just me. I'm a bit of a perfectionist, you know, but if it doesn't like make me cry, this job's not done yet. What about going back to sort of your late thirties when you're first starting, was it different then? Cause obviously you've had a lot of experience now and you've had a lot of feedback. Yeah, I'd write quite a few of the old songs differently now. I mean, I just didn't know a lot of stuff. I mean, this is a secret, right? You know, the tenor stave has this treble clef with an eight underneath it. I didn't know that that was to be sung an octave lower for about five years. I was teaching other people's music, teaching it an octave higher, thinking, oh, the silly people, they've put the soprano line, the third stave down. Anyway, I'll, I'll do it properly. <laughs> oh my God, the embarrassment. And you know, look at, I mean, even chanson, you know, the lead line is a tenor resting on, on the G above middle C. I mean, tenors, their voices almost bleed singing that song. It's such a, a marathon workout. I'd never write that like that, that, you know, now. I'd take it down or give it to the alto and rearrange it. Anyway, it's done now. <laughs> That's experience for you. <laughs> yeah. Well, listen, we're going to have to wrap it up. But before we do, a um, couple of really important questions. If someone um, hears one of your songs, they know they've, they've learned it somewhere in a choir somewhere um, and they want to share it. Um, you know, how do, they, how do they find you? How do they find out how to pay for your work? How do they credit you, tag you, all of those details? Sure. So if somebody's come to a workshop of mine, I don't, I don't charge again for them to take the music home and teach it to their own choirs generally or a camp or a festival. It's, you know, whatever I teach, they can take, take further afield. But if it's somebody who's just contacting me out of the blue, um, there's a website, my website, my name, helenyeomans.co.uk and it's got a whole scores page with categories, A to Z, um, a rate or whole arrangements Great page too. Great song shop. Um, so that's where you direct people to. to the yep. Great. Um, and do you like hearing feedback? Do you like getting emails from people? Um, that have emails, it? emails are the bane of my life, but you okay. know, 
my work's kind of drying up at the moment because we're not teaching at them you know and it could be a while so yeah people can email me um so, i've got time at the moment so i know i know the answer to this next, next question a little bit but maybe you can tell us so what about if someone said to you helen i'd really like to know how to write songs <laughs> but uh so it just so happens I'm about to film a masterclass tutorial video of Ooh. everything I've learned in 18 years about writing songs for choirs, a cappella oh. choirs. And yeah, it's going to be available very soon, by, hopefully by the end of the month. And it will be available to everybody through my website. And then I shall be offering one to one tutorials for people who are serious about writing music, who've got a song idea, maybe just want a bit of help with that. Um, and is this for people like right at the beginning of their songwriting, you know, really experienced people? Who are you looking for? Who's, who could... Well, I get asked by people who are just intrigued, actually, as well as songwriters, just people who are just intrigued, um, who have no intention of writing a song of their own or making music. They just want to know how it's done. Mm. So my inclination is to, it's quite a long video. There's so much to pack in. It's, you know, it's like probably two hours long. I'm going to break it into part one, part two, part three. And it'll be available on my on my website, probably through YouTube as well, for free. So everybody who wants to know about how it happens, you won't have to pay. But then if people who actually want to make music and want me to help them write, work on their particular songs, who really need one-to-one, -one, um, I feel like the better use of my time is to give them follow-up tutorials, which I'll then charge for. Um, and people can just contact me nearer the time about that. Absolutely amazing. Did you say a couple of weeks you think that'll be ready? I'm filming it on the 17th. It'll be probably a week, week in the editing. So I guess by the end of June. Amazing. Well, we'll definitely make a big noise about that on our own. <laughs> I think people will be all over it, including myself. As nerve wracking as it, as it feels to be, to be sharing songs. It's definitely an impulse that I think a lot of us, if, we, if we're singing, actually, you know, to be given that permission and given that inspiration and then some guidance. I think it's great for everyone. Yeah. Exciting. Fantastic. Okay, let me check my list. I haven't had to look at it at all. So let's see. I think we might have covered everything. Um, there was definitely a whole lot more, a whole lot of questions um, from our network that we won't be able to um, cover. But um, okay, do you have um, a final message to give to anybody um, that might be watching, singer, songwriter, at all? The message will probably be: don't be afraid of making mistakes experiment if you just want to get a few friends around and just experiment with a, a friends that you know rather than a big choir do that but don't be don't feel it has to be perfect at the beginning i still write songs that aren't great and just the process of doing it, it it'll add experience every time you try um making a song you're adding to your kind of experience of, of learning amazing well thank you so much helen i've loved chatting with you um pleasure thank you kate yeah, and um, I think that one of the things that's come out of this time, um, if, if anyone's watching this in the future, we're in the, the pandemic. I don't know if you remember the, the pandemic, but we had to talk on Zoom all the time. We couldn't get face to face. But one of the things that's come out of this time is I think lots of connections and maybe um, some connections have been fast tracked that we might like to have had, but our busy lives didn't allow us to. So I feel personally really happy that Singing Mama's Choir and myself um, are connecting with Helen, with Tula Mama, with with all the different um, offerings of each choir leader that we meet through this song line, this, um, this morning singing that we're doing. Um, so yeah, really grateful for collaborations and for more in the future. Um, so we, we, better press, we better press stop on this live feed and let people go about their day. Uh, but we'll be posting it on um, YouTube where there'll be some other choir leaders that people can, uh, choir composers rather, that people can meet and uh, find out about the lives of them, become inspired by. But um, we'll certainly be posting with that and with this video any links to Helen's work. So have a, a good rummage through it. So Helen's got an amazing website. Um, can you remind us it one more time, Helen? HelenYeomans.co.uk oh excellent okay great well thank you so much helen pleasure thank you kate more to more of more of your songs when we can meet in, meet in real life again thank you bye bye <laughs>